Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. I am Maruk Mumtaz, clinical psychologist and student counselor at Rashid Latif Medical Complex. I warmly welcome you all today in this informative discussion and webinar on suicide prevention acquired for moral, legal, or psychological health. It is joint effort of Rashid Latif Department of Professional Psychology from Rashid Latif Khan University, Counseling and Wellness Center, and Rashid Latif Medical Complex. Before we begin, I would like to show my gratitude to highly esteemed and world-renowned speakers from academics, research, and clinical practice who spared their time to enlighten us with their views on today's pressing topic. I would like to convey my special thanks to Mrs. Sabahat Khan, CEO, Rashid Latif Khan University and Rashid Latif Medical Complex, Professor Dr. Khalid Khan, Pro-Vice Chancellor of Rashid Latif Khan University and Professor Dr. Aftab Mohsen, Principal Rashid Latif Medical College for encouraging such platforms for awareness regarding need of the hour issues and their prevention. It is with their support and encouragement that we are gathered here today. I would like to highlight the astounding efforts of Professor Dr. Nashi Khan, Chartered Clinical Psychologist, President Pakistan Association of Clinical Psychologists, Director of Rashid Latif Department of Professional Psychology and Counseling and Wellness Center. Dr. Nashi Khan has always promoted such endeavors and focused on building deeper knowledge, ethical practice, and future-oriented learning. It is because of her that we are on this forum. As it is mentioned in the Surah number five, verse number 32 of Holy Quran, and whoever saves a life, it is as though he had saved lives of all mankind. The sacredness of life is often governed by gratitude, vitality, and motion. But at times, experiencing hurdles and difficulties in life can be perceived as overwhelming. So today we are going to discuss psychological, social, religious, and neurobiological perspectives on suicide and its prevention strategies. So, First of all, I would like to request our worthy Professor Dr. Nashi Khan for the welcome address and share her intellect on today's view. Dr. Nashi. Dr. Nashi Khan, uh, can you hear us? Okay. Gee, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Nashi. Okay. Respected colleagues and my very dear students, I am honored today to welcome each speaker of today's webinar. RLKU is very privileged to have you on board today. Professor Dr. Moddad Hussain Rana, Dr. Khalid Zahir Saab, Ms. Saima Salaman from Singapore, Professor Dr. Saima Daud, Director, Center for Clinical Psychology. Professor Dr. Rafia Rafiq, Director, Institute of Applied Psychology. Dr. Fahad Riaz from Malaysia. And our very dear Dr. Usman Hudhyana from Behavioral Sciences Department. My very special thanks to our very charming CEO and a charming principal, Professor Aftab Mohsen, and our very dear and respected Pro-Vice Chancellor, Dr. Khalid Khan, for always giving us full liberty to hold such activities. Thank you very so much. We have lost your voice. Maruf, you have to open the speaker. Sorry. Clear now. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nashi Khan, for addressing us. Every institute progresses when it has dynamic and strong leadership behind it with future-oriented vision, devising policies, guaranteeing success of every personnel and student within it. I would request our chief guest, Professor Dr. Khalid Khan, co-vice chancellor of Rashid Latif Khan University and ex-registrar of Punjab University to share his views on today's topic. Sir, the forum is yours. Sir, please uh, turn on your mic. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
the dean faculty of social sciences professor dr nashi khan the principal rlmc professor dr aftab mohsen sir respectable colleagues distinguished speakers assalam alaikum wa i feel privileged to be at this webinar on suicide prevention it is a very important topic and world bank uh, uh, world health organization is also working on that as per world health organization more than 700000 suicide attempted every year and many more attempt suicide in other way a proper a prior attempt is the single most important risk factor in the general population and 77% of countries on this globe are in a middle or low income place so this act is a serious public health problem however it is preventable with timely evidence based and often low cost interventions for national responses to be effective a comprehensive multi sectoral prevention strategy is needed in pakistan suicide prevention efforts require coordination and collaboration from all the sectors including society health sector and other sectors just like education labor agriculture business law defense politics media etc so the efforts required from all sides these efforts must be comprehensive and integrated as no single approach alone can make an impact on an issue as complex as suicide webinar like today can train front line workers such as clinical psychologist to deal effectively with at risk and vulnerable population especially youth i would like to commend efforts of services of counseling and wellness center rlmc as opportunity for students to seek help and guidance when needed at the end i appreciate the team and dr nashi and her team for organizing organizing this wonderful webinar thank you very much thank you so much sir for your views now i would like to invite special guest another leading personality behind this institution professor dr aftab mohsen principal of rashid latif medical college who is world renowned gastroenterologist of uh, of pakistan as well to further the session with his enlightening address with his diverse practice decades of experience we will surely benefit from his expertise sir over to you sab kaha kuch lala o gul mein numaya ho gayi khak mein kya suratein hongi ke pinha ho gayi the suicide comes as a shock and it leaves the family in grief but it is complicated by guilt and the guilt is that it was preventable and there is always a knock ek dastak hoti hai jo hum miss kar jate hain especially this is compounded in people who have a comorbidity and my family in my own family in my brother's family i have witnessed two suicides the entire family no longer is alive it is a tragedy which is beyond any measure and i always think of them as something as i am responsible 
there is always a knock there is always a dastak you have to be empathetic you have to make yourself available the life is too fast we don't have time to reflect find time to reflect and all those were unfortunately meeting with the psychiatrist but it could not be prevented because of comorbidity substance abuse borderline personalities borderline organic brain syndrome so my request my appeal is be more attentive be more concerned you can make the difference 800000 reported deaths every year and if not all many of them are preventable so it is grief it is guilt and it is huge tragedy that we can always prevent so my request is i'm very grateful nashi khan i'm very grateful to professor mawaddat hussain rana usman amin hutiana maruf and everybody who have joined this talk and make some guidelines especially for those who have comorbidities especially for those who are treating people with comorbidities because in comorbidity with personality traits borderline disorders and substance abuse it's hard to predict it is harder to treat and it is more difficult to prevent and involve the families involve everybody who matters and we should have more talks like this both nationally and internationally and thank you very much for asking me being here uh my appeal i can't say advice appeal is to formulate better strategies to prevent this preventable grief and guilt thank you very much thank you so much sir obviously and inshallah we will work on it as well now i would like to introduce our next speaker professor dr muaddad hussain rana chairman the healing triad and professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences rawalpindi dr rana is member of national task force for mental health the honorary chair of department of behavioral sciences and adjunct professor at university of health sciences lahore formerly chief editor of the journal of pakistan psychiatry society chairman and honor honorary professor at robert gordon university united kingdom and founding secretary journal of emdr asia he is a consultant to world health organization and various national and international academic and research bodies thank you so much sir for joining us the forum is yours is uh, you would need to give me the uh, slide share option yes sure um and uh, dr usman can you please make him the host thank you ji sir you can share your slides the uh the topic of the day is so dark and uh, depressing that i thought uh, let us not start in darkness and in distress and i think those very moving remarks that we just heard um from my very dear friend and a colleague uh, the learned professor aftab mohsin the honesty with which he shared his pain with us has obviously left a mark uh, on our hearts so i th i thought we'll i'll show you this particular slide to probably dilute the effect of that intensity that his talk has left on all of us um so this is a bit of a task for you 
And if you can just uh, shout or write in the chat box as to what do you think is written here? It's a bit, it's a little exercise for all of us to do, to just sort of break the ice. So what, what do you see here written? Written. Miles are five miles away. As miles are five miles away. Anybody else? It is also saying five miles are five miles away. <laughs> <laughs> but you prefer to read smiles at five miles away. But that was the first perception. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much for uh, highlighting this uh, particular phenomena. Because in your response, uh, Professor Aftab Mosin, you have actually uh, given us a deeper understanding of what I wanted to talk about, the epistemology. See, um, I, I don't know how many of you actually did exactly what uh, Professor Saab has just done. I read it first as miles are five miles away and then five miles are five miles away. Would, would you please raise your hands and uh, vote for this if you, if you did exactly that or not? Or if you have had a different perspective, go ahead and tell me. Yes. Miles are five miles away. <laughs> that was the first perspective. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I, I also, I continue to read smiles. I refuse to read five miles or five miles away. Is, is that a conscious uh, refusal or it just keeps coming back to you? No, when I look at it, that's what I see. I see smiles and I think the, the picture on the right, uh, it just forces you to focus on the smile Thank with you. Julia Roberts smiling on the right side. I mean, it's hard to, uh, you know, when Julia Roberts smiles, it's very really hard to look at anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Th thank God that this particular slide has brought your smiles back to you. Uh, because I, I believe that the smiles and the pains uh, live very close to each other in our brain. In fact, long time ago, as a student, uh, very early years of my life, I had read a saying by Lord Byron. And that said that I smile so that I may not weep. In fact, he said, I laugh so that I may not weep. So that made me feel that these are very close phenomena. In fact, all of us actually, even if we are laughing at the end of that huge laughter, our eyes get wet. So there's some neurophysiological proximity of the two phenomena. Uh, the smiling, the laughter, and uh, the tragedy of pain and death. So, uh, you know, when uh, Professor Nashi asked me to talk on this particular subject, I requested her that it will be useful since it, it is be the first talk of the entire session of the webinar. So I, I requested her, can I talk about the epistemology of it? And it took her exactly five seconds to send me back the message, say, go ahead, do it. Thank you very much, Nashi, for letting me speak on this particular aspect. Because what I believe is that if we do not really understand the epistemology of suicide, we may err and we may then pathologize the entire phenomenon so much that we would refuse to look at it at a, at a far bigger scale than it, that it deserves to be looked at. So uh, how many of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sitting here in this webinar are familiar with this term epistemology? Uh, just raise your hands and I would know. Okay, one. Go ahead. That's not very encouraging, <laughs> but it it is a it is a, a philosophical term so i, I do understand that uh, um, you know when when i chose this word i knew that not everybody would be familiar with this term so therefore i thought i'd start by trying to highlight to you what do we really mean by epistemology and then talk about it uh, for example this is a testimony to our understanding of the phenomenon of suicide and therefore, the epistemology of it is going to be that much different. 
Now, if you look at this statement, we are about to do a seminar or a webinar on a topic about which none of us would ever truly know everything because none of us would ever experience it. Suicide is death proclaimed by the individual himself. And therefore, he is not going to come back or she's never going to come back and tell us what is suicide. So everything that we therefore know about is epistemological. And for that, you would have to understand that when we use this word, what do we basically, what are we saying? Epistemology is basically just a branch of philosophy which emphasizes on knowing what we know, the basis of knowing what we know. Now, like all philosophical terms, it is a little confusing also, you know, what do we know? How do we know what we know? How accurate is what we know? But if you reflect on it, and I'd give you 10, 15 seconds to read through this slide, and it will come to you that what we are primarily trying to get at is that whatever we are going to talk about today in the webinar, how do we know that all that that, that we are saying is actually what we are describing? Or is it just the way that we looked at that Julia Roberts smile and then, then read five miles as smiles. So sometimes there is this gap which is produced by the illusions that are created of knowing. So I hope that makes a, that, that point is made that it's a very vague understanding of this vast subject, very complex subject that we are going to allude to during our discussions uh, today in this webinar. Now, look at the, uh, the sources that define uh, what we know. Look at them and the vagueness of uh, those resources. Just, just have a look at them. These, these are the sources that actually tell you what suicide is. And all of them, including the folklore, and I would even include neurobiology into it and put it in the same bracket as folklore. Okay, neurobiology is far more consistent. It is far more valid. It is far more scientific. Uh, but then so much that is said in folklore is so close to truth. So we must understand that the sources that we are currently using for understanding suicide are not enough. Today, if you read about neurobiology of suicide, it will try to minimize it into stratonergic transmission issues. Uh, it will give you issues related to uh, cytokines and their role in suicide vulnerability. It will give you understanding of how various kinds of protein kinases are involved to type A and type B and whatnot. And it will tell you about the areas and the lack of development of the adrenergic pathways in the brain in people who commit suicide, so on and so forth. I'd not bore you with all those details of neurobiology. But yes, there, is, there are a lot of papers to tell us more about suicide. But all I can assure you is not known. And that is the reason why we need to look at the basis of what we know before we dwell any further. So the idea of this slide is just to highlight to you repeatedly that please, whatever we speak today in this webinar, needs to come with all the humility in the world that we can carry about the vagueness, about the non-specificity and the possibility of error in our understanding of suicide and therefore all the subsequent actions that we take. This slide is essentially to generate that humility in us while we are discussing this topic of uh, suicide. Now, the common beliefs and uh, justifications. Why would a psychiatrist, a psychologist uh, talk about suicide? Because we have learned all in our, during our training that this is one phenomena that you need to be always very careful about because it can lead to fatality. And therefore, we have seen it always as a disease. If somebody comes and tells me I'm suicidal, the first thought that comes to my mind is I need to do a Beck's uh, suicide inventory on him. I need to calculate his suicide risk uh, based on the risk factors. I need to probably get him admitted in the hospital straight away and start ECTs. 
These are the four thoughts that come to my mind. And my very dear colleague and friend, uh, Usman Utyana is here. He, he might uh, tell you that I may, may not be absolutely on a tangent when I'm describing those thoughts uh, come, that comes to mind of a psychiatrist. And I'm sure not very different thoughts would come to the mind of a psychologist or any mental health professional involved in the care of somebody who comes and says, I am suicidal. Because we look at it as a disease. And therefore, we look at it in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, in terms of rehabilitating people uh, with this disease called suicidality. But then if you look at newspapers, if you look at the media, if you would look at uh, how generally people discuss suicide, it's always seen as a reaction. Pakistan is very expensive. It's so expensive that people have started to do their own work. It's been removed from the job. It's been so difficult that it's been so so we try to explain suicide as a reaction to one's circumstances of life. But then if this individual survives, that means he did try to hang himself, but was unsuccessful, immediately he's going to be rescued and taken to the police station where a dafa hai Pakistan mein jul gai yati on logon ki upar jo attempt karte hai suicide. और उसकी जो सजा है वो तीन साल कैद से लेकर छह महीने से लेकर तीन साल तक कैद हो सकती है और लाखों रुपया जुर्माना भी हो सकता है पूरी दफा है इसके ऊपर विच हैज बीन चैलेंज्ड नाउ एंड मोर ऑफ दैट इन इन अ मिनट विद यू बट इट इज सीन इन द आईज ऑफ द लॉ एज अ क्राइम अगर आप किसी मौलवी साहब के पास जाए या जो मजहबी नुकता निगाह है उसकी तरफ नजर दौड़ाए तो देन इट इज डिफाइंड एज अ गुनाह एंड गुनाह है और उसकी सजा ये है कि इनको बार बार जहन्नुम में जलाया जाएगा और ये कभी भी दोबारा चाहे उन्होंने कितने ही अच्छे अमल किए हों दोबारा कभी जन्नत में नहीं जा सकेंगे दैट इज दी जनरल अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ एंड देर आर सेवरल रीजन दैट आर कोटेड बिहाइंड दिस अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ दिस एज अज सिन बोथ हेयर एंड हेयर आफ्टर ये अलग बात है कि मजहबी एतबार से उसको क्या सजा मिलनी चाहिए दुनिया में इसके ऊपर आई हैड सेवरल डिस्कशन विद स्कॉलर्स दुनिया में क्या सजा मिलनी चाहिए तो वो इसके ऊपर खामोश है लेकिन वो ये कहते हैं कि आखिरत में इसको जरूर सजावार बनाया जाएगा और कई लोग तो इस दुनिया में ये कहते हैं कि आप ये जरूर करिए कि उस शख्स की जिसने खुदकशी की है उसके नमाज जनाजा में शरीक ना हो सो दीज आर राद very strong views that people have about this uh, phenomenon called uh, suicide now it's very important that in one slide i have shown you the same this issue called suicide as a disease a reaction a crime or a sin now how many things that can come to your mind ladies and gentlemen where you could call them this at the same time any of these four and yet we continue to do that uh when it comes to the phenomenon of suicide so spare a thought on this vagueness on this uh ridiculousness of our understanding of this uh concept of suicide and the question that you also need to keep in mind when you are discussing it during this webinar is when is it a disease reaction crime or a sin at the point when you conceive or think about suicide but like i can tell you i can't tell you about others but i can tell you myself there are several instances in my life that this thought of suicide has crossed my mind so i wouldn't bother you to you know reveal your thoughts but i'm ready to raise my hand and say and say this on this forum that there are several times in my life that conceptually suicide has crossed my mind it has never crossed your mind wonderful uh, good for you well it may not have come as an intent to me i have never tried one so therefore i can't be really considered into a post execution there is there is no post execution state uh, of suicide what can you do with somebody who is already dead so when is it a disease when is it a reaction when is it a crime when is it as a sin conception intent while somebody has done it or after somebody has done it are the thoughts that you keep in need to keep in mind when you are discussing this topic today when you are doing that 
one of the most common suicides, if you want to call it a suicide, is of this man. Can anybody shout who he is, his name? ये जो चारों पांच मैंने आपसे अर्ज किया है ये दिन में रखिएगा ये जो मैं आपको भी चेहरे दिखाने वाला हूँ इनके बारे में क्राइम सिन डिजीज रिएक्शन कैन एनी बडी रिकॉग्नाइज दिस गाय सॉक्रेटिस विद इज फेमस प्याला दिस जहर का प्याला एंड ई ग्लैडली टुक इट एंड ड्रैंक इट राइट इन फ्रंट of uh, his students and it's very important to look at this finger that he is raising somewhere in the air it's a very symbolic picture that the thoral pick so when you're looking at uh, the epistemological issues of our understanding of suicide keep in mind these uh, these people and i'm sure you're all familiar with this individual i know professor aftab is because we've discussed him in several of our interactions with professor mubashir so here is another character that should come into your mind when you are looking at suicides anybody to guess who these two people are and soni mahiwal right and uh, cleopatra and anthony and cleopatra yeah absolutely so again two people who decided to mutually uh die together you know so well of course in very different parts of the world in different circumstances uh the soni went into the river uh the two of them obviously went into uh, some other very strongly built structure but uh, uh keep them in mind when you are discussing suicide and i'm sure you're all familiar with this character called the kamikaze pilot of japan who would take his uh, uh airplane and go straight in to a ship and sink it uh, these are images that the world has seen from world war 2 and there are several movies on this so uh keep them in mind and our very own uh the chevinda cemetery where alongside these tanks in 1965 are buried several soldiers who had wrapped themselves with bombs and had then lied under the indian tanks and then went down with those tanks and they are buried in that particular cemetery which is just not that of tanks so what would you call that so keep keep those thoughts going while you're looking at these images now the, there are several questions then that would start to come to your mind if you would keep these thoughts and these pictures alive and one of them that you need to look at is that is this phenomenon the ultimate statement by a human being that nobody has the right to take my life except me and therefore okay i may not have had a say in my life but today i'm going to play god and i'm going to take my life so that's that's a phenomenological understanding of what it means or it may mean to an individual who's about to go ahead and take his own life well there there are examples of several uh, videos movies dramas even video games uh, in the last few years reenactments where people committed suicide under the influence of movies influence of uh, videos influence of various dramas and video games and so on and so forth so there there what was that that's another thought that you need to keep in mind then of course is our clinical perspective based on dsm 5 and icd 11 uh, definitions of what self harm and suicide really means and what is deliberate self harm and what is the difference between suicide and para suicide um then of course our our definition of culturally sanctioned suicides in uh, japan as you know this is eulogized tremendously the harakiri phenomenon which is locally known as seppuku uh in india i'm a rajput i can tell you 
that a uh, lot of lot of uh, uh, pride is taken in the rajput tribes to have had uh, this history of women that they left in the war uh, to jump into fire after uh, they, they were killed in that battle so that is eulogized uh, there are several movies on this concept as well uh, whether that is pathological or it is not is something that you need to discuss also during this course of our interaction um euthanasia uh, what are your thoughts on it is it a suicide not a not a suicide uh suicide bombers martyrs for some criminals for others pakistan continues to as yet uh, be one of those nations which have not uh, adopted uh, legislation on making suicide a non uh, offense and has not taken it out still yes there is a lot of debate going on uh, we were very very close last time in the last parliament to getting it removed from the penal code but as yet it is not so attempted suicide uh, is in our legislation still a crime what is the society punishing these individual about maybe you are not supposed to take your life without permission permission now the questions that i the, the last question that i want to raise for this uh, forum to actually consider is the importance and significance of biopsychosocial autopsies now we do regular autopsies otherwise uh, even they are very very difficult to undertake in pakistan but is it not important actually to undertake biopsychosocial autopsies uh, of cases that are identified who have completed their suicides and then formulate ideas i believe that probably would come into play in our discussions about suicides in the future these thoughts ladies and gentlemen are the ones that i need to leave you with to discuss and keep in mind when you are undertaking this academic activity uh, of the webinar thank you very much for your patience with me. thank you so much professor rana for these thought provoking views and definitely we have an eminent religious scholar with us today as well professor dr khalid zahir our next speaker professor khalid zahir has phd from university of wales united kingdom dr khalid also had an intensive formal religious education in islam he studied quran from dr israr ahmed molana amin ehsan islahi and javed ahmed khan Dr. Khalid Zahir has a deep and incisive understanding of the very relevant issue of Islam and modernity and has taught courses on Islamic ethics, traditions, and economics at various top national institutions, including the Aga Khan University, LAM, University of Central Punjab, Heli College of Commerce, Information Technology University, and Institute of Art and Culture. Dr. Khalid Zahir has also delivered various lectures on Islam in United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Malaysia, Japan, and many prestigious institutions of Pakistan. I would like to request Dr. Khalid Zahir to discuss about suicide and religion, different point of views. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Very much. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin in the name of the God whose mercy is profound, whose kindness is forever. I think the the starting point is also pretty uh, relevant to the subject that I'm going to talk on. Uh, there are <clears throat> at least two um, points, issues that come to my mind when I look at suicide from a religious Islamic perspective. I think it's not a bad idea that my uh, my face is not showing. Uh, the first is how can suicides be prevented? And I would like to give my understanding of the Islamic perspective. And the other one is, which uh, Dr. Mawaddat Rana has uh, uh, referred to in his uh, in his presentation. What happens to an individual? Um, 
if he or she commits suicide. Uh, let me take the first um, issue first. How can suicides be prevented? What's the uh, Islamic input to it? The first of uh, the measures that I would suggest very strongly uh, from a religious perspective is that people should be informed about uh, as much as is possible the purpose of life. It's purposelessness of life which somehow enters the mind of an individual uh, when he or she is depressed, frustrated, uh, deprived, uh, that causes the individual to finally get inclined towards taking this uh, ultimate serious decision. Uh, the contribution of religion um, in this area is, I, I believe, is, is very important that we ought to know that this life has not come about as a fluke happening. It was planned by our creator who is kind and merciful and he wanted all humanity to be put to a test trial before they would be ultimately taken to a life much better in quality um, on the basis of their performance in this worldly life. So looked at from this perspective, all experiences that we humans go through, uh, whether good or bad, whether experiences of, of success, of joy, of happiness or contentment, or whether experiences of, uh, of poverty, deprivation, difficulties, pain, suffering, etc. They are both different manifestations of that trial. In fact, the Almighty um, puts us all, almost all of us, on, all of us, uh, in these two different manifestations of, of trial in different phases of our lives. The idea is to test as to whether an individual is adequately thankful, grateful, and sufficiently patient or not. So once you have this understanding in your mind, and obviously I'm not going to get into the discussion of how to acquire faith, how to be more uh, strong and deep in your iman, in your belief. That's another matter that needs uh, a more detailed discussion. But I would just mention this fact that uh, if you were ever to make an attempt to solve uh, the uh, puzzle of this life, because this life is a puzzle, it's, it really raises some very serious questions. Who created us? Why did he create us? What is the purpose of life? Why are there so many um, differences? Why are there so many sufferings, etc.? Why do people die? And what is going to happen after death? It is a religion and God's religion which uh, promises to give clear answers to all these questions. If religion is not resorted to, uh, then uh, we will always remain unclear and confused. So uh, suicide uh, doesn't fit into the scheme of things of religion if it is properly understood. And therefore, this understanding needs to be put across, shared uh, as much as is possible, wisely, intelligently, effectively. The second uh, contribution, uh, the second uh, suggestion of religion, of Islam uh, in attempting to prevent the phenomenon, phenomenon of suicide in the society is by making people aware of their obligations towards others. We owe to others 
sympathy, cooperation, support, etc. And and obviously there is a there is a sequence. Uh, the one who is closer to you is the one who deserves more. But the entire humanity is uh, is uh, you know deserving our our sympathy and our uh, our support as much as is possible for us. Uh, this can be done uh, when we come when we talk about the question of suicide uh, to those who are marginalized. I, I'm not saying that only the poor, uh, the socially marginalized people are uh, the ones who are prone to committing suicides. I mean, there are people who are exceptionally rich. Probably, I don't know, somebody might have come up with statistics as to uh, what are the categories of people who commit suicide. And probably you might not be surprised if uh, you, you, know, you come to learn about the fact that uh, uh, it are the uh, more, it's more of rich people who, who commit suicide because of uh, vacuum, purposelessness in life. But I, I, I'm not going to delve into more in detail because I don't know the statistics. But the fact of the matter is that there are many marginalized people, poor, um, otherwise socially isolated, um, etc., cetera, um, who need to be sympathized with. If uh, there are people who know that there are individuals who are in trouble, uh, it is our moral religious duty to come to their support and uh, the more uh, serious uh, the problem the more urgent is the need for it to be done and it's something which uh, most certainly is going to earn the individual um, the almighty's um, approval and reward uh, the second category of people who uh, need to be sympathized with and helped are those who are psychologically, mentally uh, unwell, ill. And um, I'm sure this is one of uh, the significant reasons why there are many people who are inclined to, to commit suicide. And uh, uh, this, this category also deserves to be fully supported. Um, sympathy is not a bad word, though. They need to be sympathized with. I mean, uh, we always help out each other because we empathize with others because when we imagine ourselves in the position of others, you know, we feel that there is a there's an important uh, reason why such people should be helped. So uh, these are the areas where uh, it's a moral religious obligation. Uh, people should come to the help and aid of others who are likely to be uh, otherwise inclined to commit suicide. And I also very strongly believe that uh, it's uh, quite apart from obviously the other areas of uh, concern that we are talking about. Uh, it's it's a religious concern as well that the services of such experts as uh, you know psychologists and uh, psychiatrists uh, and religious scholars they should be easily available. So at times it may happen that I. I know some people, I know an individual who seems to be in trouble and uh, is very likely candidate for a suicide. I may not be able to come to his, her help myself personally, directly, but I can always refer to somebody I know uh, who can take care of the individual. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very convinced as uh, somebody who is approaching the society from a religious perspective, that quite as much as religious guidance is needed in our society. Uh, we need uh, the uh, services contribution of psychologists as well. Uh, many of the people who come to me for guidance, I believe, uh, need uh, psychological support and guidance as well. So I think these two uh, categories go hand in hand and uh, it should be done uh, in, a, in a way that we properly plan uh, our strategy to uh, reduce and hopefully remove, completely eliminate uh, the incidence of uh, suicide. Now, let me come to the other uh, question, which uh, probably is more 
people would think more directly relevant to religion. And that is, if a person commits suicide, what's his status? Uh, uh, Dr. Rana has already alluded to it, but uh, uh, let me just mention that there is no one, but at least two views on this subject. The one view that he referred to, which is more popular is, that this person took his life, which he had no right to do, um, and therefore he's destined for the hell because he has caused himself to die a haram death. Um, he was nobody to take that decision. And uh, because we know that his death is haram, so goes the understanding. Uh, we should also not offer his namaz e janaza because, I mean, we offer this prayer because we we seek the Almighty's uh, uh, mercy to forgive the individual. But if we already know that the person is doomed, uh, I mean, what's the point? And uh, probably it would be a bad idea. It would invite the displeasure of the Almighty if we are going to offer that. And, and I know that there are so many cases in our country wherein um, as soon as we come to learn about the fact that a certain individual from uh, you know, a certain family has committed suicide, there's a lot of tension quite apart from uh, you know, the sadness that there is, it's, it's naturally there. Um, that there is uh, this uh, tension, shame, which accompanies. But this is because of, of one point of view, which is uh, the predominant point of view. By the way, I, I just want to tell you that uh, there is no mention, none whatsoever, of uh, the question of suicide in the Quran. All that people have come to uh, make use of as a source uh, as, uh, are the mentions in hadith. When, when we talk about hadith literature, we are actually talking about uh, incidents reported by individuals, uh, the way they understood, perceived, and, uh, you know, sometimes people do try to contextualize uh, hadith. Um, sometimes they don't and they are taken as independent sources. Um, my understanding is that uh, all incidents reported in hadith have to be seen in the perspective of the Quran as a footnote of the Quran in order to make uh, the religious narrative as one coherent uh, presentation. So now I come to the second of uh, the understandings. Uh, the second point of view regarding suicide, how should we deal with uh, with people who have uh, committed suicide, uh, is that uh, they deserve our sympathy and uh, we should pray for their success in the next life. Um, we should offer namaz e janaza for them, probably they deserve more than anybody else um, because uh, they were depressed. Uh, they committed suicide um, in, under circumstances which were beyond their control. Uh, they were the ones who, uh, who uh, could not put up with it. Um, and therefore, instead of hating them, uh, we should sympathize with them uh, as much as is possible. As I said, although the first view is more popular, uh, I, I believe I agree with the second one. And my reasoning is, is the following as follows. Uh, I believe that there can be two broad categories of uh, the cases of uh, suicide. Uh, there are those who become so evil uh, that their evilness makes uh, them so depressed that they resort to suicide. Uh, that, I believe, is one category. Um, and therefore, they are the ones who don't deserve anyone's sympathy. Uh, the few incidents that were reported at the time of the Prophet, may Allah's mercy be on him, were the ones who belonged to this category. Uh, they were evil people, Right from the beginning, they uh, meant evil. And this evilness, you know, 
it grew, got stronger, compounded. And uh, at the end of it, uh, you know, they, they killed themselves. In fact, it's mentioned about one of them who uh, was, although apparently taken as somebody who had died as a Shaheed martyr, but the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, revealed that uh, quite the contrary, I find him in the hell because he was the one who, uh, when he got injured, he killed himself. So that's one category. The other category is that there are uh, people who are caught in a trap of poverty, social marginalization. Um, they are uh, so um, terminably, uh, interminably uh, ill that uh, you know they find it very difficult to to imagine how they'll spend the rest of their lives and they they get themselves killed uh, they find that they are not getting cured um, there are problems psychological etc when such people commit suicide they most certainly show weakness but they don't deserve to be hated uh, instead they deserve to be sympathized with and uh, saying the mother janaza for them is not just allowed I, as i said it's important in their cases and we genuinely hope that the Almighty is going to forgive them. It's only prophets and nobody else who can tell if a certain person belongs to one category or the other. If a certain person is doomed for the hell and he doesn't deserve our sympathy. When God's messengers tell us that a certain person has been decided by the Almighty that, uh, you know, his future is in the hell. Well, obviously, I uh, we are nobody uh, who didn't pray for such a person. Although it's not my subject right now, but I just want to mention uh, because that's another area which is very dear to my heart. It's the same. Um, it's the same principle uh, that is applicable in the case of non-Muslims as well. Unfortunately. We find that many Muslims, I don't know how do they live with this understanding. Uh, they believe that all non-Muslims are kafirs and therefore they're doomed to the hell. And uh, therefore, they, when they die, they, did, they don't deserve to be prayed for. Quite the contrary, it's only the kafirs who deserve that uh, fate. And a kafir is a person who knows clearly what the truth from God is. And he... Um, arrogantly spurns, rejects, and, uh, um, re and, and, and does not accept it. Um, and, and this category uh, can be found both amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, but that's a different uh, subject. Uh, and the times of the prophets are over. We do not have any divine revelation coming to any human anymore. And therefore, we cannot say for certain about anyone as to who committed suicide for one reason or the other. And therefore, we have no right to make any remarks. The only thing that we can do for a person who has died is to pray for him or her and also to worry about others who are left, who are left behind, that they should not be um, given to fall into the same trap because i had this uh, privilege of uh, listening to um, a very impressive presentation by dr rana he raised a few points i just venture to briefly respond to some of them suicide as a military strategy to me is not a suicide i mean it's it's something that's uh, done as a part of uh, the plan that is worked out by the uh, the entire system uh, it's i think it's a, an act of bravery rather than to call it uh, uh, to call it uh, suicide euthanasia uh, i i do strongly believe that uh, a person is to live here for as long as he can and uh, even if he or she is in pain we as humans do not have any right to cause death to come before it actually seems to be destined so uh, uh, I'm sure that there are other perspectives to it, but I believe that we would never uh, go for in favor of euthanasia. 
eulogizing, eulogizing suicide in Japan, etc. You know, I would not condemn them. They are a completely different culture. Uh, they have a completely different system of faith. My duty, my job is to make an attempt to help them understand what the true message of God is. And I ought to do it wisely, politely, academically. So long as they have their point of view, and if there's somebody who, if there's somebody who commits suicide because of uh, the, the burden of his conscience, and it's considered to be something um, that needs to be praised, eulogized, uh, I just make a comment. I'll not, make, I'll not have very strong words of condemnation. I would say that, look, uh, uh, looked at from our point of view, uh, it's not acceptable. Uh, I'm sure that if this person would have understood our point of view properly, and we are at fault for not being able to let him know, you know, uh, quite as uh, effectively as uh, it should have happened, uh, probably he wouldn't have done it. Now, what he has done, well, God knows his circumstances, and God is the best judge, and God has promised in his book that he would not treat anyone uh, unjustly by even the slightest of margins. So there's always hope for everyone. And finally, this, uh, this uh, debate in our society that attempting suicide is, also, is a crime. Uh, and therefore, if people survive the su attempted suicide, um, they should be punished. Honest to God, I, I find it unacceptable. I mean, there's no, there's no reason why this, this piece of le legislation should be allowed to continue. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Khalid Zaheer, for such enlightening views on suicide and religion that give clarity on many points, probably. Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Saima Salman, who is founder and CEO of Rational Living Institute, Singapore, and is one of the top leading rational emotive cognitive behavior therapists and corporate trainers in, in Southeast Asia. Ms. Saima has over 25 years of diverse clinical experiences with the American, European, and Asian population. She is also the first Muslim cognitive behavior therapist to give, uh, who, uh, who have done extensive research on Islam and RECBT, rational emotive cognitive behavior therapy. She also coined the term IRECBT, which stands for Islamic Rational Emotive Cognitive Behavior Therapy. She is clinical fellow at prestigious Albert Ellis Institute, New York City, USA, and was personally trained and supervised by Dr. Albert Ellis during her clinical fellowship. She has also done extensive training with Dr. Aaron Beck and Dr. Judith Beck at their Cognitive Therapy Institute. I would like to request Ms. Saima Salman to address this on social media and suicide, positive and negative factors on, of influence on society. Ma'am, the forum is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Maruf. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nashi Khan, uh, for, the, for giving me the honor to join this conversation. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, but I must tell you, you uh, the first two uh, conversations or the talks have made my day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rana and Dr. Zaheer. Um, I wish we were sitting in person and listening to this, and I would honestly love to meet both of you when I visit next, because whatever you have brought forward in your conversations, um, Dr. Rana, about the theory of knowledge, I have not heard any clinician or psychologist to introduce that idea. I think it's brilliant. Our kids should be taught in, in psych schools. Uh, and Dr. Zaheer, your topic, as Maruf just explained, um, the Quranic philosophy has been my go-to for the last 20 years. So it was an absolute um, delight to hear your views, which are quite in sync with mine. So I'm uh, uh, really, really uh, very relieved to hear that. Okay, so now coming to the topic uh, that Dr. Nashi gave me, uh it's a, it's it's a very tricky topic because um there is <clears throat> not a lot of research uh on the role of social media itself about pro su suicide behavior or pro self harm behavior 
So I think if we talk about the numbers, we don't have the numbers. We're, we're just beginning to understand as clinicians the impact of social media on, especially on youth. And uh, I think I feel very lucky to be working with teens and that's one of my area of expertise also. Um, I think what I would like to start with is, um, I was thinking about this talk, is one of Hazrat Ali's uh, quote. And uh, it goes something like, do not talk about your wealth in front of the poor. Do not talk about your children in front of a person who is infertile. Do not talk about your parents in front of someone who doesn't have parents. Do not talk about your success in front of someone who's struggling. Uh, so the bottom line is when you look at the culture uh, on social media, the biggest challenge is that we're doing completely the opposite of what this quote is about. And, and I'm very thankful to my dad who introduced that quote to me when I was very, very young. Um, and it has really shaped my philosophy of life. It has shaped the way I am today. I, I swear by it that when every time I'm having a conversation with someone, I, I just want to make sure that I am mindful of who am I talking to and what am I talking about. Uh, so one of my atheist friends, uh, when I shared this quote with him, he said, oh, so as Muslims, good Muslims, you can't talk about anything. And, and, and that's not a fair comment because just because I'm talking to you and I know what you lack, I'm not going to flaunt that. So there are many things, other things that I can talk about. But if you look at social media, I think the biggest challenge is that everybody is flaunting, whether it's your um, chiseled bodies or you're looking younger or you're looking hotter or you are having these fancy vacations and you're hanging out with friends and your family looks perfect and your family looks beautiful. You have a happy marriage. You're portraying whatever that's perfect in your life. And if you look at one of the biggest researches on Facebook status updates, the reality is quite the opposite. But an average person who's logging in onto their reels or on social media, they don't know that. They don't know that if I am raving about my marriage and my husband, my perfect life, what the research shows that it's quite the opposite in reality. But Coming back to the impact, what creates, what are the pros and cons? I think we all know the pros and cons. I think the pros are very, very simple. People think they are on social media because they want to stay connected with their families or friends. They want to advertise whatever they're doing. They want to learn new things. But how many of us are actually benefiting from social media? How many of us are going and looking for content that helps us feel inspired, motivated, happy. Um, I, wor I work with adults too. And sometimes I, I, in the recent last two, three years, I think over did to a lot of people that adults are coming in and saying, I feel very depressed, Saima. I'm like, what is it about? It's like, I was looking at my friend's photos and they all look so happy and I'm so miserable. I'm the only one who's miserable. Like what's wrong with me? So it's not just kids. It's it's very, very uh, prevalent in adults also. So as I was thinking about what, what, what do I want to talk about uh, when it comes to the pros and cons and its uh, impact on su suicidal behavior or pro-suicide -su behavior, I think if we Google, we all can find the pros and cons. What I want to highlight is the algorithm that the social media platforms use to create the perfect storm, especially for young adults or younger kids. So please raise your hands. How many of you are aware of the algorithm used on these social media platforms? Just raise your hands. Anybody knows? Nobody knows? I don't see any hands, there are 18 people. Nobody knows. Oh, oh, Usman, you know. You understand the, uh, okay. So Usman is the only one. Uh, Usman, can you open your mic? And, okay, hi. So what, what is it about the algorithm that 
you think creates the perfect storm? So uh, in the research, it was found that all those negative words, negative things, they kind of, you know, they jumbled up and they get more people to come. So they concluded that uh, there was this uh, ethical debate amongst the media that probably how good it is, uh, whether they should market more or uh, there was mm. a pressure that it should be limited or that kind of thing. Perfect. Pretty close, I would say. So, so I think that's one thing when we talk about uh, suicide, the, the, the exacerbation or whatever, as Dr. Rana was also saying, you know, you have already are struggling with depression, anxiety, panic, lack of self-esteem. You're already predisposed with certain factors. So I think what social media does is exacerbates what you're sitting on. So the way algorithm works, and please talk to, talk to your teachers, talk to your friends, talk to their children. The way the algorithm works is if I uh, uh, search for words like self-harm, within the next couple of days and hours and weeks, you know what's gonna happen? My feed will become all about self-harm and pro-suicide behavior. Because the algorithm learns that, okay, this is what Saima is interested in. This is what Saima is looking at. And they start to send that information to Saima. But that's not where it ends. The sad part, which there is a, there is a lot of debate going on in the West about um, Facebook and um, uh, Instagram. I wish it would stop there. The, the challenge is that after a few days or weeks, they start to send you a much more extreme form of that content. So if, if, if you're looking for self-harm, just uh, you know poking or picking, it'll start sending you ideas like, how do I cut? Uh, what kind of knife? What kind of blade? What kind of, and then your feed becomes darker and darker. And imagine if you were a 13 year old girl with eating disorders, and that's what I see a lot of in, in Singapore, unfortunately, it's very prevalent here. You not only have depression and anxiety, you have an eating disorder. The one time you write uh, self-harm and within a couple of weeks, you are just headed in a spiral. So I think when we talk about social media and that's, that's my main key, uh, key thing that I address in my conversations with my patients, especially that age group, the teens, preteens and young adults is to psychoeducate them that listen, this is what the social media platform is doing. And that's step number one. The step number two is what is it that we can give you in terms of a mental attitude so you don't let it stick to you. So, so the basic thing that you do in therapy in order to prevent someone who's at risk for suicide or self-harm is you have an open conversation. I throw numbers. I take prints out of, um, you know, uh, brief uh, blurb from the research. And I help psychoeducate the kids about what's going on to their feeds. Why are they feeling darker and darker? Why are they coming up with wilder ideas? And then talk about if you continue to think like that, if you continue to binge on social media this way, if you continue to be obsessed with that, how will you continue to feel? And if that's the goal, then you, you're doing a great job. You know, you have an A star in doing that. But if you want to fix that, then we have to develop a different mental attitude. So the, the basic point is that we have to educate the kids if this is what they want, because the, it's very clear. If you keep thinking like this, you'll keep feeling bad. If you keep feeling bad, you're going to cut more. If you're going to cut more, you're going to feel more depressed. And if you feel more depressed, you're going to search up more dark stuff. And it's a vicious cycle that we're talking about. Now, going a little deeper into why, why is social media playing heaven? not just for people who are at risk, but people like you and me and everybody else. I think what Dr. Rana has touched upon a little bit and Dr. Zaheer, I think the bottom line is that it's the absence or lack of contentment. If you would ask me, if I go really deep into the core schema, the reason why we are unhappy, the reason why we are looking for stuff 
on these platforms and the constant reminder, the constant reminder is you're failing. Uh, go buy this, go do this, go exercise more, go, uh, go uh, network more, you know, be more successful, be more rich. If you're rich, take more vacations, take more pictures. And it's incessant and it's overbearing. So if you step back, and the Quran, Quranic philosophy being my go-to therapeutic model, I personally feel, and opinions are not fact, that's my opinion, that the more we move away from what we've been given as a gift, which is the Quranic philosophy, the Islamic philosophy, the further we go away, the darker we're going to feel. So one way to whip yourself back into shape is to start working on being content. And once you are content with who you are, what you are, what you have, what you don't have, you have less, you have more, then these messages will not stick. Of course, you won't like it for like five, 10 seconds or for five minutes or five hours, but you're not gonna go into a spiral in your head because of the social media feeds that you're less, you know, you could be better. You should be exercising more. You, you should be doing this or that more. So the pressure, um, and if we talk about, if we talk about um, uh, the youth, there is so much discontentment. And nobody, if you're too thin, you're upset. If you're slightly overweight, you're upset. If you're not all straight A stars, you're upset. If, if you are way above average, you're not the top one percentile, you're upset. If your success is here and your colleagues or your friends are two notches above, you're upset. You feel like you're not doing good enough. And if you look at it, that's where the, I think REBT and CBT works beautifully. It creates a philosophical narrative for us. And the narrative is very clear that I'm good and I'm enough. And that does not mean that I'm not going to improve the, the things that I want to improve, but there's no need or a demand. And it does not mean that you're failing or you're less. But unfortunately, when you look at the social media and you look at young kids and they come in with a lot of FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Uh, a lot of fears of, oh, um, I don't look as good. I'm not as smart. 30 years ago, when we were growing up, I mean, touch word, thank God that we grew up in those times. I don't see myself coping really well. If, uh, if I was a teenager in this time and age, we had no clue. We had no clue about body shaming. We had no clue about who's hot, who's not, who's fit. We just existed. We, we did our things. And uh, there was no serious form of uh, competition. So we were, uh, as I look back, I was like, wow, we were so content. Oh my God, I, I didn't want to be rich or poor or smart or this or that. I, I was just happy being who I was and just, you know, doing my thing. But in today's world and kids who are at risk, even adults who are at risk, one way to, to help, as it, which I encourage everyone around me, and I, I do that all the time, if I read somebody's uh, news uh, uh, status update or a post, and it sends me an alarm, I always pick up the phone and I call them. No, I don't send messages. Uh, yeah, I send messages if I don't have their numbers, but I always pick up the phone and call and say, hey, you wrote that. Are you feeling bad? Are you feeling depressed? Are you thinking of doing something crazy? And I think that's the other part of suicide prevention that in our society, uh, in general, we're not equipped how, how to talk to someone who's suicidal, how to talk to someone who is in a very dark space mentally, emotionally. So I think the, the, if it was up to me, I would teach teachers I would teach uh, medical staff. I would teach uh, university staff, university uh, professors, non-psychological, on how to have those conversations. Because as I think Dr. Zahir was saying, it's not rocket science to see that someone is suffering. It's not rocket science. You, you can tell. And a lot of us would move away thinking, oh, I don't want to bring up the term suicide. Why not? 
why not? How can you address something uh, without bringing it up? Uh, so I think one thing that we can do as clinicians is to train the general public, train parents, train teachers, train normal staff, other people on how to have those conversations and and how to confront it and how to be a support system for a person who's feeling dark. And to be honest, so many times I've picked up the phone and called random people, like, of course, on Facebook, not everybody, 1600 people, not everybody is your friend. And uh, they are 80% of the time, they're in a very dark space. And they're like, oh, this phone call helped me change my mind that there's somebody who's looking out for me. And you picked up the phone and you called. And sometimes that's all you need. As a follow-up, what I generally do on, on, on social media is I send them a message every once a week that, are you doing okay? Can I set up an appointment for you wherever you are with a clinician? I would encourage you, go talk to someone. And that's the most we can do, especially with people we, we're not close to, we're not friends with, but acquaintances. So as Dr. Sahi was saying, you know, we, we, Dr. Rana was saying also that we can, we can reach out. And I think compassion uh, and empathy is something um, very important. And uh, we should not shy away from addressing it. So I think that's about it. The, the, the stigma is, the, is, is another problem. If you're suicidal in a Muslim community or society, it's, it, there's a huge stigma associated with that. And I think not being able to voice that, it adds added pressure on the person because A, you're feeling really trapped in your own emotions. And you go to social media and the messages are if you're in a bad space, nothing will look right because everybody is flaunting something positive and you start thinking that your life is crap. So I think bottom line is that if uh, we come from a place of compassion and we don't stigmatize people like that, we encourage people by talking about our own thoughts. I mean, uh, earlier there was a question like, have you ever felt suicidal? I would, I would as, a, as a seasoned clinician, I would say there are times not suicidal, but I do remember having, and the iman that I have, which is 200 out of 100, there are weak moments when I felt a couple of years ago that I wish I wouldn't wake up. And it was a very dark time in my life with uh, both my parents nearly dying, my brother being sick, my kids being away, me being in Pakistan and not being there for my, for my kids. There's days I would wake up and I was like, wow, wouldn't it be nice if I keep sleeping? Now, I don't have a suicidal plan. I don't want to kill myself. Of course, I will not kill myself. But that thought, you know, that thought, it humbles you. It, it humbles you that you are bloody nobody. You could be doing this for 25 years, but when life starts to kick you behind, you can even have those thoughts. And I make it a point that when I see depressed clients, I always self-disclose. I think that helps them feel that it's there's nothing wrong in having those thoughts. As long as we don't come up with a plan and, and follow up on that plan, we're okay. It makes us human. And I have no shame in saying that I've had those thoughts. And I'm extremely proud of the fact that I don't have any shame and I can go to any media platform and talk about it freely. So I think that's that's about it. Thank you so much for your time and patience for listening to my rant. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. Saima, for addressing and sharing this perspective. Obviously, reaching out is what costs nothing. We will surely benefit from it. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dr. Saima Daud. Dr. Saima Daud is currently working as director of Center for Clinical Psychology in University of Punjab, Lahore, and is also serving as General Secretary of Pakistan Association of Clinical Psychologists. Dr. Saima has completed postdoc from Leeds University, United Kingdom, and has more than 20 years of teaching experience with almost 35 research publications. Having years of practical experience in supervising clinical and research work, we are honored to have her today with us for sharing her views on current society standards and causes of suicide. Dr. Simon, the forum is yours, please. Thank you, Maru, for your introduction. Uh, respected colleagues and dear students, Assalamu alaikum. 
first of all, I would like to say thank you to the organizers who have given me this opportunity to be here with this audience. Uh, and they have given me this opportunity to share my views related to risk factors of suicide and current standards of the society related to suicide. As we know, and we are talking about suicide, it's an intentional act of one's own death. And suicide is a serious public health problem. And WHO in 2019 has declared is as a fourth leading cause of death for 15 to 29 years old individuals. And the latest statistics of WHO also reveal that more than 700,000 people lose their life due to suicide. When we talk about suicide and related important demographic variables, then two important demographic variables catch the attention of the researchers. This is gender differences and age. And the statistics again reveal that more men commit suicide in comparison to the women. And those who committed suicides were younger than 30 years of age. So the statistics suggest that 15 to 30 years of age bracket is at high risk. And vis-a-vis -vis socioeconomic status, again, the global statistics highlight that 75% suicides were from lower and lower middle income countries. And unfortunately, Pakistan is also one of them. When we talk about risk factors, then there is a long list which could be presented. And amongst this long list, we can say that important psychosocial factors which are responsible to increase the risk of suicide are hopelessness, poor coping skills, poor problem solving skills, poor impulse control, social isolation, lack of social support, and again, poverty. Then comes like another important risk factor is medical condition. And again, and there is an association between suicidality and chronic physical health problems, which includes chronic pain, brain injury, diagnosis of or having cancer, kidney failure, diagnosis of HIV. And it has been observed that the diagnosis of cancer approximately doubles the frequency of suicide. And frequency of suicide becomes high when people have more than one medical condition. Another important risk factor is mental illness. And 27 to 90% people who committed suicide are having one or more mental illnesses as well. And those who hospitalized with these conditions related to suicide behavior have a high risk a lifetime risk up to 9%. In clinical sample, we come across that mental disorders and substance misuse frequently coexist and substance use and misuse and the use of and withdrawal from benzodiazepine are again considered important risk factors for suicide behavior. Previous history of suicide attempt is another important predictor of suicide, and 20% of suicides have had a previous attempts, attempt of suicide. In clinical sample, we come across that some suicides are just impulsive acts due to stress, which may trigger from multiple sources. It could be financial, it could be some academic difficulties, it could be relationship problems, including breakups or divorce, it could be harassment or bullying issues. So socioeconomic status or socioeconomic problems such as unemployment, homelessness, also trigger suicide thoughts. When we talk about social standards, then we say that suicide carries a social and moral meaning in all societies. It has moral, social, and legal context. The society which has a major impact in developing behaviors such as suicide. 
suicide occurs when we all know as professionals that suicide occurs when one feels that he or she is no longer able to cope with an overwhelming situation and he or she may end up with suicide this could stem from situations life events and all other risk factors which i have already discussed about including physical problems mental problems substance use problems as well as other home related issues but critically more important is the society and its standards where we live and spend most of our time actually the society where we live in it operates with high standards of social acceptance and we all know that these social acceptances put lots of pressures for the people who are living in this society and when one is unable to meet these standards it may result in social rejection and may cultivate self esteem issues and related problems it also create unnecessary distress for that individual actually it's a vicious cycle and social rejection is very much threatening for mental health and the person either tries to meet the society standard or may opt an offensive attitude towards the society being a lay person living in society we all need to be aware really aware of important warning signs a person who is at risk of suicide may talk like that i want to die or i am like feeling guilty or i am like shameful or he or she may feel like empty or sad or hopelessness or agitated or he or she may display the changed behavior such as withdrawn from his or her social circle or he like extreme mood swings or eating or sleeping uh, change in eating or sleeping patterns or maybe some kind of self injurious behavior or self harm behavior as a member of society i think we need to put a lot of emphasis over parenting and upbringing issues being professional i think these two factors are the stems of suicide if we give a healthy childhood and healthy upbringing environment to our child i think being professional that most risk factors related to suicide will be eliminated and we may have a little you may say the grip on the suicide behavior or self harm behavior in the society this is like from my side thank you so much thank you so much professor dr saima for sharing your expertise views for understanding this dark topic it will surely help to make individualized management plans for us now i would like to introduce our next participant and speaker for this webinar professor dr rafia rafiq dr rafia rafiq is currently serving as the director of institute of applied psychology punjab university lahore her academic profile speaks for itself she has been awarded national talent scholarship her name is published in the encyclopedia of high achievers of kinnaid college right courage and love she completed her post doc from university of nottingham uk and was award, awarded six hsc outstanding research award she has more than 70 publications to her credit in hsc and impact factor journal Dr Rafia along with her team set up the largest covid-19 mental health helpline and provided teletherapy psychological services during the pandemic and was awarded the pride of nation award Dr Rafia Rafiq is well known for her contribution in different tv channels where she promotes mental health awareness i would request professor dr rafia to share her views on risk factors of suicide and vulnerable pop population thank you
Dr. Afia, I cannot hear you. I don't know if your mic is off or you are not speaking it. Okay, thank you. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes, Dr. Afia, you are audible. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so today I will be discussing the risk factors of suicide and vulnerable population. This is extremely important to study from a Pakistani perspective because Pakistan is among the few countries of the world where attempting suicide is a criminal offense with an imprisonment of up to one year or with fine or with both according to section 325 of the Pakistan Penal Code. So discussing the mental health scenario that is quite related to the number of suicides committed in Pakistan and to the vulnerable groups, it is approximately 1,500 suicides per year have been recorded in Pakistan, and majority of such cases are of individuals under the age of 25, like Dr. Saima Taut was also talking about, and experiencing severe mental distress. So around 57.9% of the population in Pakistan comprises of young people, and three uh, individuals, uh, one out of three individuals are suffering from common mental health disorders that are anxiety, depression, and stress. So between 15 to 35 people end up their lives in Pakistan every day. This is as high as one person every hour. So 34% of the overall clinical depression prevalence is reported among Pakistani youth. And 60% of those who attend primary care clinics in Pakistan have diagnosable mental disorders. Suicide affects all ages. If we are talking about the vulnerable population in 2020, suicide was among the top nine leading causes of death for people ages 10 to 64. Suicide was the second leading cause of death for people ages between 10 to 14 and those between 25 to 34. So each suicide is a personal tragedy that prematurely takes the life of an individual and has a continuing ripple effect, dramatically affecting the uh, lives of the families, friends, and communities. And every year, more than 800,000 uh, people die of suicide, one person every 11 minutes. It's a public health issue and affects communities, provinces, and entire countries. Young people are among the most affected. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death for those between ages 15 to 29 years. And the number differs between countries, but in low and middle income countries, that uh, those are the ones that bear most of the global suicide burden with an estimated uh, of uh, cost of all suicides occurring in these countries. Looking at risk across the lifespan, for example, younger individuals have experienced recent, who have experienced recent conflicts with their family, friends, romantic partners, or who are experiencing insomnia and other mental health issues are at a greater risk. Adults who are at a greater risk are males, maybe using substances and who have a recent marital or job loss. Older individuals are at a risk of death by suicide if they're experiencing multiple health comorbidities, as already many of the speakers have talked about more than uh, one medical or psychological condition, and those who are isolated or are feeling hopeless. Young people who identify themselves as lesbians, gay, or bisexuals have higher suicidal thoughts, and they have behaviors that might lead to and the uh, heterosexual uh, lead to suicide as compared to heterosexual individuals. If we have a general overlook at the current scenario of mental health in Pakistan, we see uh, different sorts of news in different channels like girls committing suicide, boys committing suicide, and uh, uh, there was in 2018 one of the case in Mustafa town in Lahore, an intermediate student who committed suicide by shooting himself, and then there was another student of Golan University Medical and Health Sciences who committed suicide after uh, repeatedly the teacher failed him because of personal grudge. So uh, furthermore, if I uh, proceed with the vulnerable population, suicide rate do vary by race, ethnicity, age, and other factors uh, like where somebody lives. By race, ethnicity, the groups with the highest rates overall worldwide are non-Hispanic American Indians, Alaska Native, and non-Hispanic white populations. Whereas countries like Pakistan, uh, like middle-income and low-income countries are at a greater risk. Other Americans with higher than average rates of suicides are people who live in rural areas and uh, work in certain industries like mining and construction. Suicide does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, it has a, a suicidal pathway that people get in and uh, it may start weeks and even months and years before the actual event of suicide. So the suicidal pathway, uh, it might be a mood or other psychiatric disorder 
uh, and or a sudden stressful life event that might lead to suicidal ideation. And there are uh, further superimposed personal factors like such as feeling of burdensome, loss, chronic pain. Then there may be imitation when suicide by one person uh, can influence another person. When there is lack of access to well-being support and to hospitals and to uh, psychiatric care. And when there is easy access to lethal means like firearms and medication, it results in suicide. So suicide begins with a suicidal thought and ideation. And it has certain warning signs that are very important to understand, like uh, the people, they start talking about what they are going to do. And then there, is, there are certain superimposed behaviors as well as mood. Like warning signs might include social withdrawal from family and friends, uh, dramatic mood swings, and uh, depression, irritability, humiliation, rage, anxiety, loss of interest, then uh, talking, writing, or thinking about death, planning about death, impulsive or reckless behavior, aggressive behavior, and there is increased alcohol and drug use, and there can be threats or uh, comments about killing themselves. So these are some of the warning signs. The foundation of an effective response in suicide prevention, that is the, the a crux that is the ultimate goal of all this webinar that how are we going to prevent suicide is the identification of suicide risk factors that are relevant to the context and their elevation by implementing appropriate interventions. So suicidal behaviors are complex. There are multiple contributing factors and causal pathways to suicide and a range of options for its prevention. If we talk about the key risk factors for suicide aligned with relevant interventions, there are uh, subdivisions like the society, the community, relationships, and individuals. So first, I will be talking about health system and societal risk factors like barriers to uh, assessing healthcare. Uh, not only healthcare, but also to the psychiatric healthcare, access to means, inappropriate media reporting and social media usage, like uh, Saima has already talked about, and stigma associated with help-seeking behavior. That is quite common in our culture. Then uh, there are community and related risk factors like disaster, war, and conflict, uh, like what are the current conditions going on in Pakistan, like with the floods there, the people who are living in these areas are at a greater risk and stress of acculturation and dislocation for people who migrate to other countries. Then there is discrimination, trauma and abuse, sense of isolation and lack of support. If you talk about relationship factors, then there is relationship conflict, continuous conflict, discord, bullying, uh, family, loved ones, history of suicide, loss of relationships, high conflict or violent relationships and social isolation. Individual risk factors are important to understand. These are previous suicide attempts, mental disorders. A lot has been talked about uh, mental disorders, job or financial loss, hopelessness, chronic pain and illness. Family history of suicide is a very strong risk factor, genetic and biological factors, and criminal legal problems, impulsive or aggressive tendencies, substance misuse, current or prior history of adverse childhood experiences, and sense of hopelessness and violence, the victimization or perpetration. So uh, it is extremely important to understand from an Islamic perspective, the risk factors, if it is forbidden in Islam and a crime in Pakistan, I wonder why do Muslims who practice the faith regularly still try to commit suicide? There are a number of reasons. Uh, mental health issues are further aggravated due to reluctance to discuss psychological issues because of the stigma associated with these psychological issues and apprehensions related to effectiveness of services being uh, provided and or uh, there is a fear of being treated poorly and then there is an inability to recognize that there were uh, people are suffering from psychological disorders because they cannot uh, they usually are unaware of the fact that they are suffering from any psychological disorders so allah almighty uh, said in quran and whoever uh, turns away from my remembrance to him there will be a difficult time so i have uh, taken a few verses uh, from different surahs like uh, the predisposing factors or risk factors of suicide and the major one is height of helplessness and hopelessness in islam and in this regard also forbids the attitude of uh, uh, at such attitudes like surah yusuf ayat uh, says that despair not of the rahmat and blessings and surely none despair of the rahmat allah uh, saves uh, disbelieving uh, folk. Allah doesn't save disbelieving folk. And Surah Hajrat and 
who despairs of the mercy of the rab lord uh, definitely is going to go astray so uh, life itself is a gift from the creator that we are obliged to take care and suicide out of despair of god's mercy or worldly problems is strictly forbidden in islam briefly talking about the prevention suicides are preventable and the risk factors that i have been talking about in my presentation like the limit to limit the access to means of suicide and to foster social emotional life skills in adolescents early identification and assessment and management of follow ups anyone who is affected by suicidal behaviors is important we need to enhance surveillance and research identify and target vulnerable groups and increase awareness through public education that is extremely important we need to uh, reduce access to means of suicide encourage the media to adopt better policies and practices on reporting suicide support individuals grieved by suicide because these are the ones who are at greater risk to commit suicide so a suicide prevention efforts require coordination and collaboration among multiple sectors of society including the health sector and other sectors like education labor agriculture business justice law defense and politics and the media these efforts must be comprehensive and integ integrated as no single approach alone can uh, impact or bring an issue as complex as suicide and so there is no single risk factor no single etiology of uh, depression we need to focus on all the aspects and all the different causal pathways thank you very much for being patient and listening to me thank you so much professor dr rafia for sharing this informative address and focusing on the preventive measures that is the need of our thank you our next speaker is dr fahad riaz who has received his phd in psychology from monash university malaysia in 2018 and currently serving as an assistant professor and clinical psychologist at a public sector university in malaysia Prior to his doctoral study, Dr. Fahad completed his postgraduate studies in clinical psychology and served in public, private, and development social sectors in Pakistan. And currently registered as an international member with the Malaysian Society of Clinical Psychology. For his doctoral study at Monash University, Dr. Fahad has earned many meritorious institutional awards. including travel grant award for presenting his work in scotland and also completed his placement at cognitive behavior therapy research un unit at monash university australia he has 22 research publication in scopus index international journal and relate, uh, related to mental health i would request dr fahad riaz to share his knowledge on suicide prevention interventions and outreach programs dr saab the forum is yours uh thank you ms marook uh my respected seniors colleagues juniors everyone i would like to wish you a good day and assalamu alaikum uh thank community i would first like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing such an activity which is very much required uh and especially i am really grateful to professor dr nashi khan for inviting me and always giving me multiple opportunities to live with her so today the topic that is given to me is about suicide prevention and outreach programs so i will be taking the holistic approach in explaining what needs to be done uh, for running successful campaigns for you know suicide prevention so according to my understanding i have break down it into three uh three sub parts the things that needs to be done at individual level at community level and ultimately at national level so uh first of all we need to understand suicide from the perspective of those who are you know going through this uh, problem what it is like to take your own life for someone who is having these suicidal thoughts i my background is in qualitative research so i take this uh, this approach of you know participants or patients perspective so first i need we need to understand that they are at that point in their life where they see no light it's all gloomy means taking a uh, sitting for competitive examination something like medical exam or css these kind of exams have become so much 
horrible that they prefer to take their life instead of facing that uh, that much anxiety provoking uh, situations so first there must be some things not all few things that we can do at individual level look around yourself look for people who has some change in their behavior these are also called suicide warning signs these i'm i'm not going to uh, discuss this in detail because these are just a click away you can easily find the signs like change in behavior someone who was social becomes isolated social withdrawal or they are having the emotions of hopelessness or those symptoms which are very common in major depressive disorder the point to consider here is that in, at individual level we need to pick up these signs a person who is thinking about suicide will at any time they will be talking about it if not directly maybe indirectly they will be giving some clues some hint to their significant others we need to pick that and we need to take that seriously if they are saying that it's too gloomy it's better to end uh, uh, end my life or it's something like uh, rather taking this uh, step in my life i prefer not to do anything even these kind of uh, words when they are coming there is no harm in checking with them that extending your help by giving them a listening ear there is a myth around this that if you start talking about suicide with someone it will induce suicidal thoughts believe me there is nothing like that research tells us that even if you ask someone who was who is not suicidal you are talking about suicide it won't induce something like suicidal ideation and it won't trigger their suicide uh, ideation so always extend your help give them a listening ear empathetic listening that we call empathetic listening non judgmental listening without labeling without saying it's something horrible this is not a solution it is haram without saying these things offer your help by providing them the listening ear so the, this is the first step at individual level that what we can do what could be the other signs change in behavior as i said someone becomes so calm or someone become more aggressive someone looking for the ways to commit suicide searching the material or the methods to do it someone writing will saying goodbye note uh, writing goodbye notes to loved ones so these are all are the things so for this we cannot do much but just to offer our help in terms of uh, extending a listening ear and definitely referring them to the professionals like clinical psychologist or some suicide uh, helplines so that is at individual level it's as i said it's just a google away if you just type it you will find all these but the my main focus would be on prevention at community level we need to do something like community led uh, programs so in the countries who are serious about uh, doing suicide prevention they are training their people in by offering these kind of gatekeeper trainings or psychological first aid training this gatekeeper training is something which is evidence based it has three components of questioning persuade and refer so this training is for lay person we need to educate our masses about this how by you know by introducing this training to different stakeholders not only in the health sector but in all the department in all the ministries in all the institutions of the country like once there was this uh, national cadet training uh, ncc it was i think mandatory or something for those who have just done their matriculation so the same way you need to make this kind of training which should be mandatory for everyone who is graduating from the matric relation or who who is the freshman in the college we need to make this kind of training accessible we have a good workforce in pakistan that is called lady health workers we can use them we can train them into the this psychological first aid so that they can spread the word and they can look for those who are vulnerable and um 
there are some other community led projects in some countries which are based on uh, rural populations where there are high number of suicides so they restrict access to uh, to the suicidal material something like the pesticides so we need to you know uh, make some plan for that as well by creating something like uh, what do you call the pesticide banks so this is the initiative at community level i would like to share with you that recently i visited australia and i was amazed to see that i was invited into one of the psychological first aid trainings and that training was specifically for the imams the muslim scholars or the those who are running religious organizations and the uh, fathers or priests of the churches so those those people were trained by the uh, psychological first aiders by the psychologists by clinical psychologists so we need to do this kind of steps we need to include them include the religious clergy into this we need to focus and train these people who are minority we need to uh, make resource group within this youth group especially for transgender for lgbt uh, population for religious population for all the groups and as i said that this is a uh, not a uh, responsibility of merely uh, psychologists or mental health professionals there are multiple stakeholders in it so merely the health sector is not responsible for making such a program so i call such a prevention program which is multimodal and multi sectoral what is mean by multi sectoral that it is having multiple sectors in it you need to include your uh, finance ministry you need to include your human rights ministry you need to include health education you need to include law ministries into it because it's also a legal issue so then it's a well coordinated uh, you know approach uh, or effort if we make it inclusive for all and if it is coordinated at different uh sectors now at national level what needs to be done law making decriminalizing the suicide so this uh, criminal criminalization of suicide this it has its roots in the colonial british raj so we need to uh, you know make amendments in the law so first there need to be a uh, we need to draft a law and then need to implement it previously i remember in 2017 someone forwarded a bill into the parliament and but it wasn't like approved and in recently in last year i think there was again a bill for suicide prevention but still it's in its infancy and the because the government was changed so we need to make it happen like we need to decriminalize it some countries recently they have uh, decriminalized suicide countries like singapore countries like india they have done this constitutional amendments so we need to uh, do that as well now uh, the ultimate you know the constitutional responsibility of mnas or the members of national assemblies is to do law making which we unfortunately rarely see so we need to make more laws Uh, related to suicide prevention and those laws must go to the grassroots level not limited to the major cities only not within the district level it should go to the you know tehsil levels and union council levels so only then it would be a, a well coordinated or what i call the multi sectoral effort for uh, suicide prevention so this is all that i wanted to share uh, regarding this suicide prevention plan i'm not covering the plan of individual as i said that you can find easily it there are many websites apa related websites where you can see those uh, individual level interventions or prevention but this is the holistic picture this is holistically we need to approach this um, problem by including all these stakeholders thank you
Thank you so much, Dr. Fahad, for such informative address regarding the first-hand interventions and preventions. Our next speaker is our renowned psychiatrist, Professor Dr. Usman Hotiana, who is currently working as Professor and Head of Department of Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Rashid Latif Medical College. His specializations are forensic psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and philosophy, and have interest in psychodynamics, critical psychiatry, and forensic psychiatry. I would request Dr. Usman to address this webinar on neurobiology of societal behavior. Sir, the forum is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very thankful to all the participants, the host, Professor Nashi Khan. जब मैच शुरू होता है तो बड़ा मुश्किल होता है फर्स्ट पहले प्लेयर से लेके जो एंड प्लेयर तक आती है तो गेम बड़ी खतरनाक हो चुकी होती है कई दफा तो आज भी जिस तरह सुसाइड पे बहुत सारे डिस्कशन हो चुकी है कॉजेस भी हो चुके हैं पॉसिबल तो लेट मी ऐड फ्यू थिंग्स व्हिच कम टू माय माइंड आप इस इस बंदे को पहचानते हैं जो तस्वीर नजर आ रही है डाविन डाविन से शुरू करते हैं आज की स्टोरी तो क्या एक सेल जो होता है जो इंसान का एक सेल है उसके अंदर एक सिस्टम होता है सेल्फ सुसाइड का एपोप्टोसिस उसे कहते हैं वो सेल जब बहुत सारे सेल मिलते हैं तो जाके एक ऑर्गेनिज्म बनता है और वो जो ऑर्गेनिज्म बनता है दैट बिकम्स वेरी कॉम्प्लेक्स सो नॉट सिस्टम आर नॉट वेरी सिंपल द सिस्टम हैज बिकम वेरी कॉम्प्लेक्स तो एवोल्यूशन में जिस द पिक्चर ऑफ चार्ल्स डाविन तो एवोल्यूशन में कुछ लोगों ने काम किया है एवोल्यूशन साइकोलॉजिस्ट ने कि क्या रीजंस हो सकती हैं कि जो इंसान है वो सुसाइड जैसा अमल करता है बिकॉज यूजली लाइफ ट्राइज टू सेव इट तो उनका जो कंक्लूजन था वो ये था कि इंसान की ब्रेन इतनी सोफिस्टिकेटेड है कि उसका एक आउटकम ये ट्रेजिक आना ही था कि इट्स सो सेंसिटिव सो काइंड ऑफ कंपैशनेट एंड इट फील्स द सफरिंग टू सच एन एक्सटेंट दैट सर्टेन पीपल विल चूज टू एंड देमसेल्व्स मुझे याद है मेडिकल uh, स्टूडेंट्स जब मैं मेडिकल स्टूडेंट था किंग एडवर्ड में तो वहां पे गाने के लिरिक्स कुछ ऐसे थे कि ओनली मैन हैज द चॉइस टू गेट आउट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड नॉट द एनिमल्स तो दिस दिस चॉइस हैज टू बी वैल्यूएटेड तो ये जो एवोल्यूशनरी साइकेट्रिस्ट जो मेंटल हेल्थ प्रोफेशनल थे साइकोलॉजिस्ट थे इन्होंने देखा कि बहुत सारे सुसाइड्स पेन की वजह से होते हैं पेन वर्सेस द ब्रेन तो ब्रेन बहुत हद तक पेन ले सकता है लेकिन लेट्स से हमारी कैपेसिटी वन थाउजेंड वन थाउजेंड यूनिट्स तक है तो इफ द कैपेसिटी गोज टू वन थाउजेंड एंड वन और गोज टू टू थाउजेंड तो अल्टीमेटली आवर सिस्टम ब्रेक्स डाउन एंड वी गो टूवर्ड्स इट एक पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू उनका ये था कि एवोल्यूशन में जो भी लोग रिप्रोडक्शन के काबिल नहीं होते सोसाइटी को कुछ गिव बैक करने के काबिल नहीं होते ओल्ड पीपल मोस्टली डिजनरेटिव इलनेसेस वाले या वैसे भी कुछ चीजें uh, जो कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट नहीं कर सक रहे होते सोसाइटी में तो सोसाइटी का उनसे ऐसा रवैया होता है कि ऐसा ऐसा they are also deleted from the from the community jaise yahan pakistan mein aapne dekha hoga ki agar ek aurat ka bachcha nahi ho raha to usko itna zyada social impact hota hai ki hum chahe hum kahe ki suicide haram hai lekin we will push that person to the wall till they will think that life is not worth living and all all that uh, cycle phir kuch aise log hain phir unka khayal hai ki jab kuch log delete ho jate hain to unki jo kin किन्समैन होते हैं जो उस कम्युनिटी के बाकी लोग होते हैं उनको फायदा होता है तो कुछ लोग जब आपने देखा होगा कि कैंसर पेशेंट्स मिसाल के तौर पे दे थिंक कि दे आर बर्डन टू द फैमिली उन पर पैसा खर्च हो रहा है ठीक उन्होंने नहीं होना तो वो जब अपना हिसाब किताब करते हैं तो समटाइम्स दे ऑल्सो ऑप्ट टू गेट आउट ऑफ दिस थिंग इनका जो चौथा कंक्लूजन था मुझे बड़ा इंटरेस्टिंग लगा उसमें उन्होंने कहा कि जो साइकेट्रिक एलिसिस हैं दे हैव अ प्रोटेक्टिव रोल एक बंदा था वो वॉज सो determined to die by suicide but he gets depressed so the jaise depression hota hai uske andar energy khatam ho jati hai us act ko pura karne ke liye or that gives that person some time to think over it jab aap cheezon se hatte hain apne social life se hatte hain thode der ke liye to reflection jo thoughts ko hum negative thoughts kehte hain basically is a process of reflection 
तो उसमें देर इज समाइम द पर्सन थिंक्स अबाउट हिस्स लाइफ वो उसको एक डिले मिल जाता है बिल्कुल ऐसे ही सब्सटेंस अब्यूज में भी Uh, आपको पता है कि लॉट ऑफ पीपल सेल्फ मेडिकेट और दे इंडल्ज इन टू ड्रग्स लाइक अल्कोहल बिकॉज दे आर ट्रीटिंग देयर ओन डिप्रेशन दे आर फेसिंग सम काइंड ऑफ हार्ट ब्रेक सम काइंड ऑफ लॉस ऑफ देयर ब्रेक डाउन ऑफ देयर डिजायर और जो भी उनकी एक्सपेक्टेशन थी तो आई वॉज रीडिंग वन ऑफ द पेशेंट्स उनका पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू तो उन्होंने कहा जी मेरे अब्बा जी थे वो जब तक शराब पीते रहे तब तो तू ठीक थे द मोमेंट He he went into recovery, rehab mein gaye, he could think lately, to unhone pistol li gaye and they, he kind of shot himself. So, ye tha ji, evolutionary part. Let's go to the next part. Socrates. Ab, jo suicide hai, kya ye ek rational amal hai ya ek moral amal hai? Hum bahut saare aise kaam karte hain jo moral to nahi hote, but rational hote hain. Misal ke taur par income tax bachana. Aap kehte hain ki acha main income tax bachata hu. अगर फाइन हुआ भी तो इट इज वेरी नेग्लिजिबल बहुत कम चांसेस है पकड़े जाने के तो ओके सो यू टेक दैट डिसीजन फिर कुछ डिसीजन होते हैं जो ए मॉरल नहीं होते बट उसमें रैशनैलिटी uh, वेरिएबल होती है मिसाल के तौर पे आपका दाखला बहुत अच्छी जगह हुआ नंबर ए प्लेस हार्वर्ड में हो गया लेकिन यू डिसाइड कि मैं पाकिस्तान में रह के पढ़ता हूँ बिकॉज रैशनली उसमें मेरे खर्चा बच जाएगा और, और कुछ रीजन हो सकती है दैट्स so फाइन सुसाइड में क्या रैशनैलिटी है और क्या मॉरल प्रिंसिपल्स होंगे तो यहाँ पे जो फिलोसॉफिकल पॉइंट मुझे पसंद आया वो ये था कि वी ऑलवेज वैल्यूएट क्रिटिकली कोई भी स्टेट नंबर स्टेट वन और स्टेट नंबर टू लेकिन स्टेट नंबर टू होनी चाहिए क्या मैं शादी से पहले बेहतर हूँ या शादी के बाद बेहतर हूँ क्या मैं जॉब रख के बेहतर हूँ क्या जॉब के बगैर बेहतर हूँ क्या मैं सैकेंड्री चूज करके बेहतर हूँ या वैसे किसी और सुसाइड का ये मसला है कि स्टेट टू हमें नहीं मालूम स्टेट टू का हमें कोई अंदाजा नहीं कि क्या है क्योंकि साइंटिस्ट वी हैव टू टॉक इन रिसर्च टर्म्स तो जो फिलोसोफर्स होते हैं वो भी एक खास टेक्निकल इंफॉर्मेशन के बीच में खेलते हैं तो वो कहते हैं स्टेट टू तो नॉन एग्जिस्टेंस है तो डिवीजन क्रिटिकली तब एवेल्यूएट हो सकती है जब स्टेज वन और स्टेज टू का आपको पता हो तो यहाँ पे वो फिर गाइडलाइन ये देते हैं मेरे ख्याल में वो कहते हैं कि इफ यू आर थिंकिंग ऑफ एंडिंग ऑफ योर लाइफ दिस मीन यू आर नॉट थिंकिंग क्लियरली गेट सम हेल्प to start thinking clearly kai dafa hum patri se utar jate hain phir kuch questions hain jo aapke main samne rakhta hu pehla question hai ki kya is life worth living life inherently achhi hai ya zinda rehna acha hai ya marna behtar hai ya marna bura hai isme wo kehte hain ki bhai agar aapne evaluation karni hai to main aasan se tarika aapko batata hu ki jo hedonistic principle hai sabse basic principle freud ne bhi bataya pleasure and pain अब आपकी पूरी लाइफ में अगर प्लेजर ज्यादा है यू विल लाइक टू लिव और अगर पूरी लाइफ में पेन ज्यादा है पेन एक्सीड्स द प्लेजर तो हो सकता है आप अपनी हिम्मत के हिसाब से अपने डिसिप्लिन की वजह से अपने स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ योर फेथ और डिफरेंट चीजों की वजह से प्रॉब्लली यू कैन फाइट टू अटन लेवल बट अल्टीमेटली इट कम्स डाउन टू द इम बैलेंस बिटवीन द प्लेजर एंड पेन प्लेन पेन प्रिंसिपल फिर वो कहते हैं कि थिंक ऑफ द लाइफ एज अ वेसल तो वेसल में हो सकता है बहुत गंदी चीजें हैं बहुत सारी डिसअपॉइंटमेंट्स हैं डेथ ऑफ लव्ड वंस हैं डेथ ऑफ लॉस ऑफ जॉब है लॉस ऑफ सिग्निफिकेंट वंस हैं और भी किस्म के इश्यूज हैं तो क्या एक लेवल आ सकता है जब द वेसल इज नॉट दैट गुड बिकॉज ऑफ द बर्डन एक और स्कूल ऑफ थॉट कहता है कि द वेसल इज अ फंटेस्टिक वेसल चाहे जो मर्जी हो जाए लाइफ विल ऑलवेज बी बेटर देन द डेथ एक ये व्यू है ये जो तस्वीर पे चीज नजर आ रही है कैन समी रिकनाइज इट ये जो चीज है ये इट्स डेथ कैप्सूल तो कुछ कंट्रीज में जहां पे उनका ख्याल है वो कहते हैं कि लाइफ बिलोंग्स टू यू एंड यू आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर इट तो इफ इन सर्टेन कंडीशन जहां पे लाइफ आमतौर पे वो कंडीशन जहां पे डेथ इज इनएिटेबल मिसाल के तौर पर ऐसा कैंसर है कि मौजूदा साइंटिफिक नॉलेज के हिसाब से यू आर डूम टू Die or probably you are going to get into a vegetative state. वहाँ पे they give you they will give you an option के आप you will be evaluated by a psychiatrist and if the psychiatrist tells you that there is no active psychiatric illness, then you may choose this decision. Decision गलत है या सही है ये तो different religions का अपना take है अपने countries का अपनी अपना law है हमारा यहाँ पे law नहीं है. लेकिन जस्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाई समबडी विल टेक दिस डिसीजन तो उसके लिए मैं आपके सामने एक सिचुएशन रखता हूं मिसाल के तौर पे 
I know that after one month, I will go into a vegetative state. Doctors ke saap se, scientific knowledge, jo bhi chize majuda hai. Or now, after one month, I will be in a position that I will not be able to take this conscious decision. One month ke baad, I will be, main aap loon ke rahe mukram pe hoonga, apne bachon ke rahe mukram pe hoonga, begum ke rahe mukram pe hoonga. If I want to take some decision, I have this one month to think about it. This is the, the, the discussion which goes on in different ethical debates, uh, whether somebody should take a decision or not. Those are laws and rules. I have to take a look at this. I have to take a look at this. I have to take a look at this. I have to take a look at my favorite subject. Suicide is not that event that just happens. एकदम से हो जाता है हमें नजर तो वही आता है सुसाइड के भी एक बंदा है वो आपके सामने उसने जंप लगाई एंड ही किल हिमसेल्फ अगर हम इस टेंपोरेलिटी को हटा दें टाइम को हटा दें तो हमारे बहुत सारे एक्शंस हैं विच आर सेल्फ सुसाइड आपने पढ़ा होगा सिगरेट पीना पांच मिनट जिंदगी खत्म कर देता है सम काइंड ऑफ रिलेशनशिप्स आर वेरी टॉक्सिक सम काइंड ऑफ वर्क इज वेरी टॉक्सिक साइकेट्री इटसेल्फ मेंटल हेल्थ प्रोफेशनल्स का अपना काम बहुत टॉक्सिक है तो जो रिस्पेक्ट रिस्पेक्ट हम उस तरह काम करते हैं कि मिसाल के तौर पे आपका पिस्टल है तो यू आर एट अ हाई रिस्क तो जो पुलिस ऑफिसर उसको जब गुस्सा आता है इंपल्सिविटी ही इज डिप्रेस ही विल किल हिमसेल्फ वेरी नाइसली ही हैज हिज बुलेट्स एंड द पिस्टल इन हिज हैंड साइकेट्रिस्ट है ही विल कीप थिंकिंग लॉट ऑफ टाइम्स टाइम लेगा सारा कुछ और अगर साइकेट्रिस्ट है विद द पिस्टल तो रिस्पेक्ट इज काइंड ऑफ स्टार्ट मल्टीप्लाइंग जिस तरह हार्ट डिजीज में जो रिस्पेक्ट इज है वो मल्टीप्लाई करते हैं एक्सपोनेंशियली हाइपरटेंशन है डायबिटीज है कोलेस्ट्रॉल है लाइफस्टाइल खराब है और डिप्रेशन है तो एवरीथिंग इज मल्टीप्लाइंग लाइक एनीथिंग यहां पे हम आते हैं आगे और जो आज का जो मेन जो मेरा फोकस है दैट इज इज देयर एनी बायोलॉजिकल कंपोनेंट टू सुसाइड ओके तो सुसाइड में बायोलॉजी का क्या रोल है अब किसी भी बायोलॉजी के लिए किसी भी बायोलॉजी के लिए आपके लिए ये जरूरी है कि कोई क्या हम अभी तक किसी भी लैब टेस्ट हम बना सके हैं कोई कोई हमारे पास एविडेंस है सुसाइड की क्या हम कोई टेस्ट करके सुसाइड के बारे में पता कर सकते हैं कि सुसाइड इन लोगों में पहले होगा या बाद में होगा तो गोइंग टू अ वेरी बेसिक बायोलॉजी जस्ट थोड़ी सी चीजें हैं अभी तक की जो सबसे ज्यादा एविडेंस है दैट इज ऑफ सरोटन तो जो कंसिस्टेंट एविडेंस आई है कि सरोटन के Uh, जो uh, जो स्ट्रॉटन के एविडेंस है कि स्ट्रॉटन का लेट्स से जो प्रिकर्सर है ट्रिप्टोफैन प्री ट्रिप्टोफैन ये अगर कम हो जाता है ब्रेन में और या स्ट्रॉटन का जो मेटाबोलाइट है सबसे कॉमन दैट इज कॉल्ड फाइव एच आई ए ए फाइव रॉक्सी इंडोल एस्टिक एसिड तो जो लोग सुसाइड करते हैं उसमें क्रॉनिकली ये कम हो जाता है ब्रेन के अंदर ये एविडेंस आ गई हमारे पास फिर स्ट्रॉटनिन के रिसेप्टर्स नाउ स्ट्रॉटनिन हैज अ 13 फैमिलीज और उसमें डिफरेंट सब टाइप्स हैं उसमें सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट जो रिसर्च हुई है दैट इज ऑन 5HT1A एंड 5HT2A एंड 5HT2C तो 1A और 2C ये डिफरेंट एडल्ट्स और टीनेजर्स में इन्होंने भी इनकी भी कंसिस्टेंट फाइंडिंग है कि ये रिसेप्टर्स बढ़ जाते हैं जब स्ट्रॉटनिन कम होती है तो रिसेप्टर्स बढ़ जाते हैं ये काम सी एक मोलिकुलर uh, लॉजिक है और लेकिन टीने, टीनेजर में कुछ इनकन्सिस्टेंट फाइंडिंग्स आई है इसका मतलब टीनेज सुसाइड इज अ बिट डिफरेंट और हमने लास्ट बात भी की थी एक और डिस्कशन में कि जो टीनेज का जो सेल्फ कटिंग बिहेवियर है या जो सुसाइड बिहेवियर्स हैं दे आर नॉट हार्ड कोर सुसाइड दे आर नॉट इन हार्डवेयर में उतना वो स्ट्रॉन्गली नहीं लिखे गए जितना जेनेटिक्स के वाले से हमारा ख्याल है तो हमें जब सुसाइड की बात भी करते हैं तो वी हैव टू डिफ्रेंशिएट डिफरेंट ग्रुप्स तो देर लॉट ऑफ सुसाइड बिहेवियर्स एंड देर आर सम सम पेशेंट्स दे आर सम पीपल जो जेनेटिकली देर आर प्री डिस्पोज फॉर सुसाइड तो वो लोग जिसमें स्ट्रॉटनिन का मेटाबलाइट कम है वो एक चीज में मिल गई रिसेप्टर्स का मिल गई एविडेंस फिर हमारी जो डिफरेंट जो हमारे बाकी न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर्स हैं मिसल नॉर एड्रीनर्जिक इसका भी जो मेटाबलाइट है एम एच पी जी मिथॉक्सी हाइड्रोक्सी फिनाइल ग्लाइकोल ये भी कम कुछ स्टडीज में आया है लेकिन ये बहुत कंसिस्टेंट फाइंडिंग्स नहीं है बाय दिस इज अ फाइंडिंग इन्फ्लेमेटरी मॉलिक्यूल्स पे बहुत काम हो रहा है इन्फ्लेमेटरी मॉलिक्यूल्स साइटोकाइंस दे आर प्रोटीन्स और ये डिफरेंट कंडीशंस में बढ़ जाते हैं 
और जो सबसे सिंपल जो एविडेंस आई है वो इंटरल्यूकिन की आई है तो इंटरल्यूकिन वन टू सिक्स डिफरेंट पेशेंट्स हु कमिट सुसाइड और हु ट्राई सुसाइड या सुसाइड विक्टम्स के पोस्टमार्टम के बाद जो रिजल्ट्स जो रिपोर्ट होती है तो उसमें देखा गया कि ये इन्फ्लेमेटरी रिस्पॉन्सेज बढ़ जाते हैं तो प्रॉब्ली दे ऑल्सो है रोल सबसे मेजर एक और जो सिस्टम है जो आप सब जानते हैं जिसकी बहुत ज्यादा एविडेंस है दैट इज द एच पी ए सिस्टम हाइपोथेलमिक पेजिटरी एक्सेस तो ये जो सिस्टम है ये कॉमन स्ट्रेस में बढ़ जाता है इसका काम इसका फीडबैक लूप खराब हो जाता है इसके uh, आपको पता है कि कॉर्टिसोल लेवल बढ़ जाता है स्ट्रेस के अंदर और जब हम इसको टेस्ट करते हैं तो वी कैन टेस्ट दैट हाइपर कॉर्टिसोल लेवल through a challenge of uh, dexamethasone to uske naam pe test bhi hai that is called dst dexamethasone suppression test to jin logo mein zyada stress hoga depression zyada hogi who are more prone to suicide unme dst would be abnormal to so, suicide wale jo category hai usme bhi is test ka kuch zikr hoga acha ji ab in sab cheezon ke baad ye tasveer jo hai jaise nazar aa rahi hai ye ek platelet hai aur platelet mujhe bahut pasand hai uski reason hai ki research mein इसका बहुत ज्यादा रोल है प्लेटलेट में न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर हैंडलिंग बिल्कुल वैसे ही होती है जैसे ब्रेन में न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर हैंडलिंग होती है तो प्लेटलेट में टू ए जो है उसके लेवल्स के ऊपर भी काम हो रहा है कि पेरिफिली हम प्लेटलेट का जो रिसेप्टर लेवल है वो चेक कर सकें न्यूरोट्रोपिक फैक्टर्स बहुत सारे न्यूरोट्रोपिक फैक्टर्स हैं जिसमें बड़ा मशहूर ब्रेन ड्राइव न्यूरोट्रोपिक फैक्टर है बी डी एन एफ ये एक फैक्टर है जिसकी कोशिश की जा रही है लैब लैब वैल्यू आ जाए और उसको हम चेक कर सकें अभी तक तो नहीं आई लेकिन बहरहाल इस पर भी काम हो रहा है पी पे इसके बाद जो चीजें हैं वो ज्यादा थोड़ी सी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड uh, हैं इसके बाद हम बात करेंगे ट्रांसक्रिप्शन ट्रांसक्रिप्शन मेथड्स की कि जब सिग्नल्स डीएनए uh, को हुक्म देते हैं कि आपने सर्टन प्रोटीन्स uh, बनाने हैं तो ट्रांसक्रिप्शन लेवल पे भी एम uh, जो एम है इसका जो प्रोडक्शन है वो डिफरेंट है सुसाइड पेशेंट्स में उनमें डिफरेंट प्रोटीन्स बनना शुरू हो जाते हैं यही प्रोटीन्स ही ने रिसेप्टर बनाने हैं इन्हीं प्रोटीन्स ने दूसरे केमिकल्स बनाने हैं साइटोकाइन हो चाहे चाहे वो इन्फ्लेमेटरी सेल्स हों क्योंकि ये बेसिकली ज्यादातर प्रोटीन्स ही हैं फिर जो एविडेंस आई है वो है सिग्नलिंग सिस्टम के अंदर बॉडी के अंदर दिमाग के अंदर सब कुछ सिग्नल पे ही चल रहा है और सिग्नल्स क्या होते हैं सिग्नल्स एक सिस्टम है बहुत मशहूर दैट्स कॉल्ड पीआई सिस्टम फॉस्फोनोसिटाइड सिस्टम तो ये जो फॉस्फोनोसिटाइड सिस्टम होता है ये डिफरेंट केमिकल रिएक्शन से शुरू होता है और इसके ऊपर डिफरेंट प्रोडक्ट्स होते हैं उन प्रोडक्ट्स को भी मैयर करके लैब में कोशिश की जा रही है कि फिर क्या प्रोडिक्ट की कौन सी चीज क्या हो सकती है इसके अलावा एक एक एरिया है दैट इज लाइपोप्रोटीन्स लाइपोप्रोटीन्स पे भी काम हो रहा है कि उसका भी कुछ हो सके चले इसको हम थोड़ा कंक्लूड करते हैं कमिंग टूवर्ड्स द एंड पेरिफेरल प्लेटलेट टू ए फाइव एच टी सी टू ए ये जो एक टेस्ट बन चुका है जो लेबोरेटरी के लेवल पे है एक्सपेरिमेंटल लेवल पे इसकी जो सेंसिटिविटी है दैट इज अबाउट फिफ्टी इट कैन पिक द पीपल हु विल ट्राई टू कमिट सुड इसकी जो स्पेसिफिसिटी है दैट इज अबाउट सेवेंटी सिक्स परसेंट यानी कि इट कैन टेल यू के कौन से लोग में कम चांस है सुसाइड कमिट करने का तो आपको पता है हर टेस्ट में सेंसिटिविटी होनी चाहिए और स्पेसिफिसिटी होनी चाहिए सेंसिटिविटी होनी चाहिए कि हम इजिली लोग पे कर सकें कोई छूटे ना जैसे हम कोविड में करते हैं स्पेसिफिसिटी होती है टू चेक एग्जैक्टली के भाई ये जो हम चेक कर रहे हैं एग्जैक्टली वही चीज निकल रही है कि नहीं यहाँ पे हम एंड पे आते हैं और बात करते हैं कि अगर ये सब कुछ इतना आसान है बायोलॉजी इतनी क्लियर है चीजों का यहाँ तक हमें पता चल गया है कि सुसाइड में जो माइक्रोग्लाया है जो ब्रेन की जो जो उसकी जो सेल्स की लेयर है वो चेंज हो जाती है तो ये कोई इतने हैरत की बात नहीं है क्योंकि जो हमारा ब्रेन है वी आर इन अ डायनामिक रिलेशनशिप बायोलॉजी और एनवायरमेंट बहुत डायनामिक रिलेशनशिप में चल रही होती है क्या सुसाइड रोकना हमारे कंट्रोल में है दिस इज द क्वेश्चन ये लीगल क्वेश्चन है कि भाई क्या somebody who's trying, uh, क्या आपके पास इतनी वो पावर है आप अपना डिसाइड कर सकते हैं चीज के नहीं कर सकते इट कुल बी लीगल क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो तो इसके मिसाल में यू देना चाहूंगा कि हमारे अंदर बहुत सारी इंस्टिंग्स होती हैं 
जैसे भूख की इंस्टिंक्ट है तो हमें सबको भूख का सिग्नल आएगा कि जी भूख के प्रोटीन्स बढ़ जाएंगे कि आपको भूख का टाइम में एपेटाइट बढ़ जाएगी हाइपोथेलमिस से सिग्नल आ गया बट उस भूख को आपने एड्रेस कैसे करना है यहाँ पे काम आएगा आपकी ट्रेनिंग का कल्चर का योर uh, आप कितना ग्रेटिफिकेशन डिले कर सकते हैं कितनी ट्रेनिंग तो एवरीथिंग एनवायरनमेंट विल फॉल इन दिस कैटेगरी तो भूख की तरह ही आप इसको इम्पल्सिविटी को देख सकते हैं कि आप कितने इम्पल्सिविटी को रोक सकते हैं एंगर को चेक कर सकते हैं और सुसाइड इज ऑल्सो मोस्टली इट्स इम्पल्सिव डिसीजन लेकिन वेल थॉट डिसीजन जो बायोलॉजिकल एविडेंस हमारी साइकेट्रिक एलिसिस की है वो भी यहाँ यूज की जा सकती है एज एन एविडेंस तो 90 परसेंट सुसाइड इज इन साइकेट्रिक एलिसिस उसमें सबसे ज्यादा डिप्रेशन का रोल समझा जाता है उसके बाद बाइपोलर स्केजोफेनिया और इन तमाम चीजों में भी जेनेटिक कॉम्पोनेंट इज वेरी एविडेंट सुसाइड सुसाइड विल ऑलवेज रिमेन कॉन्ट्रोवर्शियल बिकॉज इट हैज टू मेनी साइड इज नॉट वन सिंपल सब्जेक्ट Uh, nobody wants to kill themselves suffering is a very subjective subjective occurrence so mere khayal mein yahan pe i will stop the discussion bahut shukriya aapke to bajo ka aur sunne ka back to dr maruf shukriya thank you so much dr usman for such interesting views and enlightening us with neurobiological perspective Now I would request Ms. Zunaira Tariq for closing this highly informative session with the vote of thanks. Over to you, Ms. Zunaira. Thank you so much, Ms. Maro, and good afternoon, everyone. It has been such an honor to be part of this webinar on suicide prevention. On behalf of Rashid Latif Department of Professional Psychology, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of our esteemed speakers. A special thanks to our chief guest, uh, Dr. Khalid Khan, Pro VC, Rashid Latif Khan University. Thank you, sir, for being here. So, as a doctor, I am most in principal Rashid Latif Medical College for always supporting such activities. Thanks to Professor Dr. Mohammad Tarana to be with us today and sharing the alarming epidemiology of suicide in underdeveloped countries. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Dr. Khalid Zahir, for highlighting the uh, light, uh, bringing light the religious aspects of suicide. And sincere thanks to Ms. Saima Salman who joined us from Singapore all the way and highlighted the role of excessive social media usage and be, uh, being the excessive risk, risk factor of suicide. So, Mr. Dr. Saima Daud, Director CCP Punjab University, it was great to have you sharing the meaningful role of society in suicide and triggers in current society scandals. It was a pleasure having Director Institute of Applied Psychology, Mr. Dr. Rafia Rafi, to have with us. Thank you, Dr. Afia, for shedding light on the vulnerabilities of the people that put them at risk for suicide. I would also like to thank Dr. Fahad Yaz, CBT therapist from Malaysia. Our participants truly have learned a lot of preventive measures from your talk. Dr. Usman Amin Hutana, head of Department of Psychiatry, RLMC, for his impressionable comments. Thank you so much, sir, for being here throughout this session. I would like to pay my special thanks to all the organizers, especially Ms. Maruf, Ms. Zaima, Indad Sahab, and IT team. Professor Sahib and uh, marketing team. Last but not the least, uh, our very dear Professor Dr. Nashi Khan, who is always on the go for something full of energy, making things easy, so easy and quick. That is really amazing, ma'am. In the end, I would like to express our immense gratitude for our CEO, Ms. Sabat Khan, who has given us free hand for such activities. Thank you, Madam Sabat, for your endless support throughout the way for this seminar. I pass my warm thanks to all the participants for this significant presence in this webinar. Thank you, and Allah Hafiz for my side. Thank you so much, Ms. Zunaira, and thank you once again to all the speakers. Have a nice day, Allah Hafiz.